Hey, it's Corey at Blue Plate, 3218 Mission Street. Come see us. Meatloaf, fried chicken, deviled eggs, Dollar Olympia beers. We're here every day of the week. We got a garden and we got smiles on our faces. Come let us make you happy. Public service announcement. Go put on some music, go rock out, go get some chores done, go take a cruise, whatever it be. I've had a hard time listening to music lately. I'm starting to put it back on. It's helped me do stuff around the house, start moving again, so. It's a start. Music will soothe the savage soul for sure. But anyways, this is more of a shout out. It's for Shane at uh, SMFM. Uh, I've been rocking out every episode. I'm not playing. Uh, so far, it's been a Grave Dodger. That was the, the provoke of the stoke. And really, it was that last uh, band, Cardiel. And what I wanted was Homegirl to get on the fucking mic and start screaming because I know she had something to say. But anyways, keep that shit up, dude. Get to the underground. And let's just keep rocking out, dude. Thank you for the help, guys. I love all y'all. Fuck are they, dude? I need I need my talking Schmidt, man. This is Dave Bashinsky. You tuning in to Talking Schmidt. Let's fucking roll. A little bit of intro. Yes. This is the moment. It's cool. Like tonight is the night. Provoking the stoke. <laughs> I guess we're dancing now. Talking Schmidt, dude. <laughs> Bipolar is fuck, that guy. I wouldn't say it was fun. What do you mean, bro? Christian Fletcher's younger brother. Fuck the doggers. Oh, big dogs in. What do you think, Dolan? We on? Schmitty? That was the worst thing I'd ever seen in my whole life. Dude, we need a magazine. I remember that. What are Yun's doing? Black skateboarding history is very important. Holy shit. Frisco. I can What is happening? This here for Greg Smith. Yeah! Gregory! <laughs> Wi-Fi check one, Wi-Fi check two. I don't know what happened, but the pause button was on. Not fucking good. Thank you, Dave. We're starting over. This is Talking Schmidt with Dave Vichinsky. <laughs> Dave, thank you. Um, Yeah, let's talk about your upbringing. You were out in... uh. St. Louis, you said, and then you moved to Lowell when you were a kid. Your uncle got you into skating and take it away from there. Yeah, dude. Thank you so much for having me on. Psych, Hell yeah, man. dude. I just love it. It's great to see you, man. It's been <laughs> fucking like you were saying, like, was it 14 years or something? It's insane. Time has been cruising. Yeah, I'm overdue for a San Francisco mission. So oh, yeah. I keep you in the loop. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, growing up, uh, I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, yeah, parents ended up getting a divorce when I was, I mean, real young. I think like early 90s, I was like five years old and my mom's family was from Lowell, Massachusetts. So we ended up going up there and uh, lucky enough, my family's all builders and they built her duplex onto their house, which at that time being a single family ma, she was, you know, so grateful because grandparents could take, watch me my uncles were there and they skated. Uh, they had a fucking rad ramp in the backyard and I just watched them skate. So that was like the raddest thing ever. Um, but yeah, early 90s, just grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, small little uh, industrial city just north of Boston, like 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, watched the uncles like skating. I, I was like six years old, just like watching them get a piece. And like, it was the gnarliest ramp at that point. Like, a six foot ramp to a small kid just watching them. That was rolls. like another world. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, when you see stuff like that, like it's not shit. Like when you're street skating, you kind of see ledges and stuff all the time and cars and handrails and you don't think they're skatable, but you are you identify these things. But when you see like yeah. a quarter pipe or a half pipe or a full pipe, you're like, what the fuck? Like this is made for skating. It's kind of crazy. Um, yeah. Tell me the 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 Salba story. We got Greg Ware from Lowell. He's a good homie of mine. And uh, what's his yeah. connection to the whole thing? Dude, so awesome. Like it was crazy because I never really paid attention to the history, but I always remember this name, Greg Ware. And he designed four of the skate parks in Lowell, Massachusetts. So like early 90s, I think I was like 12 years old. Um, this highway barrier company called Situate. They would make the barriers for the highway. They found out that they could make molds and they ended up like making prefab skate parks. So like a quarter pipe, but no transition at the bottom. 
So they would bring all these obstacles to these towns and just drop them. And there are these concrete forms. And then the down or the, the town would come and asphalt the bottom. So like every year dealing with the seasonal change of winter and summer, like these, these skate parks will have like this transition at the bottom where it would like grow. So you do like, like just fully like crack right at the bottom of like a little spine or like a quarter pipe. So like every year we were fixing these things up, but it's been like, I mean, the parks are old at this point. So yeah, the wear and tear, it's just like constantly fixing up these classic parks, but like just so fun to like adventure, like, you know, the next town over and you have this like crazy layout, like that's so different, same obstacles as your town, but just like different layout. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Classic New England parks. Like I, I'm excited to see like someone make a book about just skate parks and why they're there and all that. Like yeah. we, I mean, it was an old tennis court and like, some of the years like it was soggy soggy asphalt you know like literally you'd push and i remember people coming to town and like this is your fucking park like this crummy thing and it's like dude this thing was this place is awesome (laughs) like it's home but like you couldn't push because it was like a soggy asphalt on a tennis court you know (laughs) right dude so how old were you when you used bondo for the first time oh shit i mean i remember more of the days bringing out like six by eight pieces of wood, giant plywood on the car for landing, you know, like there were so many spots. I think that because like, especially around that time we were into rails, like if you could fucking 13 years old skating a handrail, like that was goals. You know what I mean? So it was like searching out that next thing was definitely like, yeah, like the upgrade was like a bigger rail or like a hubba and every spot we needed wood basically in you know, Massachusetts. So remember mm. those days, but Bonnie went, dude, I don't even know. Think about this. Like in our lifetime, at some point, we used to go from the metal signs and you would put a uh, duct tape yep. around to cover cracks. At some point, some genius was like, hey, this Bondo <laughs> shit is way better. And, and uh, I don't know when that exactly was, but like, we were a yeah. part of that you know like in in the so next rad. generations people have some other shit, but we'll be like this is how this is how it evolved and it's kind of what yeah. i take a lot of pride in is being of our generation to like help the evolution of this thing we love so much a hundred percent i'll give about the the secret sauce right now for uh, granite and for marble wedges plumbing putty it dries in 20 minutes and it fills in because usually granite has like that crack every like six feet. They put another block. Yeah. That crack usually like creates like a little like waterfall, let's say. Mm. And you just put that putty in, it dries in like 20 minutes. And it's the secret sauce. I learned that back in Massachusetts. But like, dude, it goes such a long way. I'm so curious who brought Bondo. I'm going to have to dig into that. We, we got to like, get that up? one. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> that question and who like officially i kind of feel like the mag had to have been part of it but the Mm. official like abd rule like you can't do that because it's already been done obviously before street skating that was not a rule like it's not like oh hasoy already did a lean air you know what i mean i mean dude we can't be fucking having that you know like i i i love skating like do whatever you want you know what i mean but Mm. for what it is like i remember going to towns and like ask what has been done like those dudes have grown up there like they've already paved the path of what has been they set the bar you know what i mean like i i remember people coming through and i'd be like damn i mean that was at the point of video vhs's you know yeah and it was just like you'd see your friend do it and then you'd see like a pro do it and it's like damn like and then it would be in the mag the photo too you know it was oh shit like wishing the homie got like the credit but yeah i mean teach their own for Skate sure board. like everybody does have different uh opinions on that stuff so your 13 kind of skating rails is the influence chris trembley like gallant these who who are your big guns i mean obviously pj's wonderful horrible life video probably blew up the whole area but uh yeah who are some of your guys that you're putting on your wall or like inspiring you there's so many good skaters. I mean, Rob Welsh, Dandra Hobel. Really? Chris Trembley, uh, Ralph Murphy, Ed Driscoll, uh, Zared. Like, Zared was vicious cycle. 
best part out like dude that was just straight new england skateboarding and just raw like yeah you can't beat zarin's part i mean that's like up there with pj's wonderful horrible life like he just set the 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 scene for new england like there's like hidden pockets of different towns and all these skaters grew up in different sections and it's like i mean nick don pierre he was just south of he was down in taunton or new bedford and that's like an hour and a half away i really never got to cross paths with him and it's like there's all these small pockets of like amazing skaters let me i mean nate greenwood like another in massachusetts like yeah the scene is just from we got a little bit of everyone you know Mm -hmm. running whiskey (laughs) last name that i could throw out there like so many good skaters you were saying westgate's the only guy that pulled off staying out there and not moving to cali yeah like literally i think between social media even before social media westgate was the only skater that had a career and being part of the industry and not having to leave Massachusetts. Like he structured himself like in the raddest way where it was like, dude, the cranberry bog. Like he was like hardworking New England and just the sickest skater out. And there everyone was like, Yeah, he's got passed. Like <laughs> rolls. What's up with the Tech 3K? That was your group, yeah? Yeah. So wow, you're bringing it back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, early days, like Growing up in Lowell, like the skate parks really brought everyone together. We were like, you know, 13, 14. And that was like just the meetup spot, you know? So I ended up meeting up with Nikki LaMarche, Manny Santiago, uh, Ricky LaMarche. There was like a whole crew of us. Oh, you know Manny uh, for days, huh? Dude, yeah. Manny literally just like watching him try to flip into everything at that age range. I remember actually the Tech 3K video, I was like, dude, you're not going to flip into everything in your part. (laughs) (laughs) He proved me wrong. Like, like, okay, I'll do one pop (laughs) shove it into something. (laughs) I mean, it's great. Like, dude, Manny, he's like, he has secret tricks, like pop shove Smith 180s. Like he's done that on the gnarliest spot. And I'm like, no one's doing fucking pop shove Smiths. And like what you can do on a skateboard is just, unbelievable and now another first impression from manny santiago it's a funny story uh the first time i met dave i just started skating i maybe i skated uh one it was like my first year into skating and i ended up going to the best skate park in Lowell, mass which was the hadley skate park and as i get there i keep hearing stories about this kid who's super good and uh people were annoyed at him but it was because he was so good and learned so fast and then i remember running into dave at the park and he was already front side flipping off the corner which is like a two foot stage and i just gravitated towards the skating he he just made everything look so easy he was super humble super nice and very welcoming and i knew that from that day on i would skate with this person probably for the rest of my life because we always think that right we're gonna do something for the rest of our lives and uh 23 years later we're still at it so uh yeah dave's a gem and he can also backflip on rollerblades so don't get it twisted he can do everything but yeah that was like our crew like tech 3k was from the skate park but then we were in that like range where we ended up grabbing like a camera and just searching all back roads so like my mom was like a single mom and wanted me to stay at the house and not go like stay at other people's houses. So everyone would come to our house and they would just stay at my spot. And every day we just go skate, like hit back roads and just explore and just find every single thing that we could. Like there was no skate spots app or whatever the fuck like, and we were the pioneers of the town technically. Like mm-hmm. there was no one to really ask like, where, where are these spots? You know, like some of them. Yeah. Like, but for what it is, it's just a small industrial city. So Lowell was like our searching ground. We would just take the bus and just go downtown and just skate all this stuff. So yeah, we made a little crew and just made hoodies and like made a little local video and yeah, it just blossomed where like, the 
the crew that was older older than us was called Tech 5C, which was, if you break it down, was technical. So Tech and then 5C, which is a nickel, their crew was technical, which was sick. Um, but they ended oh. up having a camera and they really brought us in. So Justin Hogan and Sean Hernandez, all those guys were the generation above us in Lowell. And we would we ended up ditching our camera and uh, filming with him. And it turned into the Thanks Camera, Hello Goodbye, um, Nor'easter. So all these early videos were like all local, just skaters. And we were just doing our thing. Your family had some history out there, yeah? Yeah. Like, it, it, I go down the rabbit hole nowadays where I'm like, I go back and visit Lowell and like, me and uh, Manny, we, we've basically been skating for like almost 25 years together. So it's pretty nuts. Like I'm like, Salt and like, pepper. Oh, like we're having this like modernization. They're just upgrading all the new buildings or all the classic like buildings. So a little history on like my family came from Ireland, ended up going to Nova Scotia and then working their way down to Lowell. And that was like a, a factory building uh, or in the industrial city where there was all these factories. So there were like shoemakers and all this stuff. And they were just like bottom of the barrel, like digging out the canal ways and like laying brick. And I start, I'm starting to find out that like my grandfather and other uncles built a lot of the places that we skate. So, which is really rad. Like they were like the brick managers or like, they, they ended up making like the auditorium downtown and like that's like spots that we skated back in like the early 2000 uh that time frame and it's so rad because it's like that history is there but i'm just still learning but lowell is like i mean jack kerouac was from there and it's just like the hub just north of boston for like 30 minutes or it's 30 minutes north of boston so it's like perfect to get outer skirts and actually like skate something that has like a little vibe to it you know is that, um, are you considered a townie living out there? No, that's the hardest working city. <laughs> Lowell's actually full of artists, which is rad too. So yeah, it's got like this history of like hardworking, yeah. but it also has like a ton of creatives. Okay. Tell me about, um, you know, getting hooked up, like uh, was Venture and uh, City kind of your first like companies that you're with after your uh, skate shop and stuff, yeah? And then going out to SF. Yeah, I, dude, it, like growing up, I was really lucky because my uncles, I followed their path and they had a skate shop. My uncle Steve had a skate shop up in uh, Hampton, New Hampshire. Oh. And basically, I mean, he didn't really hook me up because I was so far away. It was like an hour and some away. But it kind of got me sparked where I was like always following like other skaters and stuff like that where it kind of transitioned where I wanted to get, you know, like product. So I, we were making these sponsor me tapes. And uh, I mean, those are classic days, just dubbing into a VHS and like getting all that footage over. It was so hard to do. And I remember like sending one to street corner. I was like, all right, like you would wait like weeks, you know? And I'm like, fuck, I never heard back. And then like a couple months later, I ended up making another one and I'd send it. And uh, at this point, email came around and I got this email and it was from uh, Moose. And he's like, someone came into the warehouse, <laughs> stole the TV and the VCR with your sponsor me tape and all this hubba gear. <laughs> like, Wait, what? He's like, can you send another sponsor me tape? I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Like, who I is right point? Point? <laughs> with all this shit? And who has the sponsor me tape? <laughs> fuck. So yeah, early days, like I ended up, yeah, sending another sponsor me tape and uh, got on, I think I, they ad offered me think, and I was like, I'm going to pass for now. And cause I was talking to New York at that time oh. and they put me on venture and that was like, I've been skating those since day one. So I was so hyped. Mm. Welcome. Welcome back. Good people to episode four of SMFM for you, for me, for all of us together in this Daylight Savings Edition where we're going to celebrate the sun, the sunshine, the sunlight. 
with a great band called Mysterium, who are from Sweden, and they're just seeing the sun. After months of winter darkness, so we're going to listen to Mysterium with the song Close to Me. That was like the early days of getting involved in yeah, Street Corner. What do you think was on that uh, Sponsor Me tape? Was it a lot of mini ramp stuff? Was it mostly street? Was it a combination? I Definitely street. At that point, yeah. like That was like, I think, 15 years old, just exploring back roads and finding those cutty little spots around the wall um maybe some in boston that was the early days probably like nor'easter that uh justin hogan made the video so yeah probably those days so what happened with zoo york that you end up on city like how did that all go down (laughs) wow there's some history so it was crazy um they ended up coming to do a demo in rye new hampshire um and it was at Rye Airfield, the biggest skate park. So Zurich, I mean, come, having a demo in New England early days was the sickest fucking thing out. I remember like Shorty's coming to town, like Jamie Thomas just ripping whole zero demo. Like it, it was some classic goodness. When a demo came around, you were there. Right. And uh, I ended up going to Rye and skating with those guys and just kicking it. And they asked me to come on a tour. I was like, Wait, what? And uh, at that point, they have been flowing me boards through my uncle's shop. And so I hop on the hop on the, the trip and we ended up going down to like Tennessee. And I mean, Harold Hunter's there, Zared. And this is like prime days where like Zared, he was just like just ripping like he was filming for vicious cycle. And it was just like the raddest thing to watch. I actually was lucky enough to film his last trick in vicious cycle, that 50, 50, like he literally handled it. And it was like a gnarly, like monorail grind, grind down like a, a 20 stair or something. Like it was just hefty. So like that was really rad to get in the van at that age. I was like young and uh-huh. uh, they ended up bringing me and Robert Mont Lopez. We were possibly the new AMs for the team mm. or boat riders, whatever you want to call it. And so I, I ended up getting in the van with them and uh, dude, yeah, we ended up going down to Tallahassee or uh, Tennessee and Atlanta, Georgia, I believe. And just like skated, did demos along the whole way. And uh, it was sick. Like we skated some rad spots. And then um, I ended up going back to a bowl after that. And uh just skating, filming, and uh, I ended up hurting myself. I was like, damn it. And at this point, I was young. Like, I didn't know. Like, I was like, I call up Jeff Pang. I'm like, dude, like, I'm hurt. I can't, I can't come on the next trip. And he's like, you sure? I was like, dude, I can't. Like, I'm hurt. Like, I would love to come, but I don't want to, like, waste space in the van. Yeah. And uh, he's like, all right, I'll catch up with you. And, uh, you know, a couple months go by, whatever. I'm like, oh, can I get some boards? No response. Fuck! <laughs> Damn it! Uh, it's just like you did not like. I, the meaning is like hop in the van, be part of the team. You know what I mean? Like he just uh, like ended that tie. So, like, fuck. so mm-hmm. yeah, that was the end of that. And uh, I mean, I remember getting some alien boards after that, which kept me float. But Jeff Pan gave it to me just straightforward. Like you're you're if you're part of the ride, hop on in. You know. Okay. So that was my learning lesson: being hurt and not. <laughs> <laughs> getting on the road <laughs> and then <clears throat> excuse me and then being through venture uh, eventually those are kind of the same people so you're you're cruising around with dan z he shot your venture ad you meet tony vitello yeah. and then city kind of opens up the door yeah so it went from alien they were really you, i mean were you were original fine. like w- was that the beginning of city with street corner i literally got in really early days like i yeah. remember seeing like Pete Elridge had a board and Mike Maldonado. Like it was the sickest graphics, the raddest team, but it was small. I remember like Alex Klein, uh, Russ Milligan, like the raddest dude out. Um, Tony Montgomery, like there was like a, some Philly goodness on in that brand. And it was just very early days. It was sick. And I, I ended up uh, kind of transitioning, I think visiting 
Dan Z out in San Francisco and hopping in the truck with him where it kind of led me to city. And that's really where it like turned into something. So I'd say that was probably like 2005 days, something like that. Like it was rad. I would like walk in the street corner. It was like this little niche, like think was just like the top tier, like just still ripping. Mm. And, uh, I remember just hubba and like, that was the sickest thing out too. Like at that time, mm. uh, yeah. Like just having all these brands and walking in as a kid and seeing a distribution and being like, dude, this shit is nuts. Like, <laughs> but yeah, um, I think, just rolling around with Dan Z got me into street corner and really like got me involved. Like Tony uh, was basically like my father. Like he literally just got me involved in skating and was like the raddest dude that helped me out so, so much along the way and just got me. Yeah. Like out there just, yeah. Got me involved with just skating with Dan and getting out on missions and, yeah, being part of uh, a team. Was was Fausto alive at that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tony, I think that's actually what kind of happened was like during the time that I was involved, it was so sick because we were like running around. We were probably the first team to do these trips and we'd film and edit and upload them. I think even before YouTube, it was like Apple or something. Like we'd have these, edits, but it was the raddest thing out because it was like city to city. And like Tony would be on those trips and like, we'd have a whole crew together. It was the sickest thing out. That. And um, it was just these fun, rad, like little pockets that we hit. It was like Detroit. I mean, actually Detroit was r- just ruling. Like we did it during go skateboarding day and hard. Oh. Pop, so, like everyone came out. And uh, at this point, city, kind of grew where we had like Jeremy Reeves, uh, Eduardo Craig, Jimmy Cow, and those guys like, dude, just, I remember that demo or demo. We were just skating the streets. We took over for go skateboarding day. Sick. Like, Jimmy Cow did a Nolly 5 down this hubba. And then there was a rail on top of it. And Jeremy Reeves just comes through and front blunts this like hubba, but his board is hitting the rail as he's front blunting. And it ha- he like wrote it out through the kink. And, uh, I mean, that, that trip, like it was like, you know, a a five day trip and those were the sickest things. Like we ended up going up to Washington and, uh, yeah, I just kind of ran around and yeah, city to city. That was like the best thing, best times ever. (laughs) Where in all this is, uh, El Toro happen? That was like the transition for me turning pro so like i i actually <laughs> sit so bringing it back the kickflip down on toro was in 2006 so oh. that was i was on city probably from like 2004 leading up so we were doing all these like small trips and stuff like that and then i remember i got involved with oakley through a rep Mm. Back in Massachusetts and I was kind of visiting California off and on and we ended up uh being out in Cal they got me out to California I was like hey I want to try it and um I remember actually after I landed it all of a sudden I looked down at my phone and I, I have a phone call from Cameron and he was working at street corner he's like hey what's going on I was like ah oh, dude just just hanging out like I actually just ended up like kick flipping this 20 stair and like I ended up like shooting the shit with him and whatever. I hung up the phone and literally like the next month, my whole life changed. I never thought anything of it or whatever, but like that literally kind of put me on the map where it was like, it, it, yeah, I, it transitioned to me where they're like, Hey, let's film like a pro part. Let's start doing like these small little trips. And like that, that got me out there. It was the sickest. Yeah. The last thing I expected, but yeah. So what, it was an Oakley ad. So Oakley was filming a video and we ended up doing some trips. I remember we went out to Canada, we went out to Shanghai, China, and we were filming and I wasn't supposed to have a part. And I don't know where it tied in. I was just kind of on my own ship, like just street skating. And at that point, uh, I remember talking to a friend, Alex Godoris, we were out night skating next to El Toro and we were like, let's go check it out after skating. And he was like, I'll skate the rail. And I was like, 
fit. Like he was a really Alex Kadoris ripped. Like this dude, he had a, he he could back one anything, and he was like, oh, "I'll skate it," and I was like, "Oh, I'm down. I'll skate it with you." And uh, I had the idea. I was like, "I'll try to kickflip it." And at some point, I was back in Massachusetts, and probably like you know, two weeks of winter or whatever. I was like, "Get me out to California," and I hit up Oakley, and uh, they got me out to California, and I just ended up trying it, and it aligned, and it worked. And that transition to having a full part in the Oakley video, and that was really, I mean, Ricky Beatenbaugh, like put that all together. And the dude, just, a ruler, yeah, dude, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best. So he ended up like making that video, and like, dude, that video got everywhere. Like, I, I go wherever I travel, like, I go down to Brazil, they'd be like, dude, yeah, Bob was in it, right? Dude, he had the gnarliest kickflip in there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there was so much. Like, the crew was awesome. Like, Chris Sen, there were so many rad skaters in that. And just to be a part of that, and it was distributed like worldwide. I was used to local videos. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, I love that shit. Like, still to this day, but like that video put us on the map. So, yeah. you ended up, your first board is City or Think? City. Yep. City. So, I, yeah, I ended up having a board with City, and that was around 2007, I believe. Mm. And I was out in San Francisco, like Dan Z, like him and Tony, I owe my career to them. Like those guys are the fucking best. Were you staying at Dan's? So, yeah, Dan, I would end up like kicking it with him. And like literally, he is always on a mission. Like that was always the best part. Like, if, yeah. Anything that you have in mind, like, let's make that shit happen. Yeah, picking locks, so. <laughs> Bond Dylan, whatever. He's like MacGyver out there. 100%. So, yeah, that was kind of like the backbone for me. It was like being part of that and uh, being out in the Bay, like just adventuring with him because he was always doing something. And I think over the course of like the next two years, I kind of like just stayed at like Double Rock. That was like my living quarters, which was like so rad. And it kind of transitioned to. That was before Redder, right? Or was that with Redder? That was before Redder. So I lived in the warehouse for like two years, which was sick because everyone would just like come through and skate. And I was just like full skate route. Like I'd be like out there at 11 at night, just getting slash kinds in or whatever the fuck. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for those days, it was it was rad because I was just close to going out and filming with Dan, and just uh, just yeah, part part of the scene, you know, just like skating every day, and that kind of lasted for like a year and a half. And I remember just like I didn't have a car, so it kind of sucked. And I was like, Manny ended up moving out to LA, and. I ended up kind of following his path. I was like, dude, what's going on down here? I was up in San Francisco for like two winters straight. Like mm -hmm. I want to change it up, see what, see what was going on. And um, it was rad. I ended up kicking it with Manny and I was like, I got to get out here. So I just flew back to Massachusetts and made like a cross country trip um, with the friends. We did like a whole tour. It was like, where the Vox at the time I was on Vox and I was like, Hey, can I get some budget? I got Cody McIntyre on and we literally just drove all the way down to the South with all the friends. Oh, it, was, yeah. it was so damn rad. Like we just skated all day, all night, but just partied the whole trip and just did like a two week drive solely across the country and just skated everything. Um, and we made a little short uh, edits and like, yeah, ended up living out in, LA after that it was kind of like this transition that like sadly like Fausto Vitello ended up passing and Tony was like I'm going to work at the Mac like that was his you know that that's the bible so yeah. he ended up uh selling a lot of street corner off to Deluxe and Rob at Low Card and City kind of after the video we did or after turning pro that's that transition where he moved over to the thrasher and rob kind of took over and dissolved city and kept think mm. so we all ended up riding for think which was rad because manny was on there danny fonzalita like there was a crew that was really rad um but yeah that was like the was next jake nunn still on there who jake nunn no dude 
Jake Nome is so damn good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to him and I think he kind of left right before that maybe. Um, hmm. Yeah, that was a crazy time. And Tony obviously is such a stud for like losing his father and then just grabbing life by the balls and going full into fucking the mag and he's been killing it you know like i work with him every day and he's inspo like his little instagram clips he's fixing up spots skating as much as he can with his crew you got chenzo out there the hype man like the, the yeah. crew's the crew's too cool i've known those i've known them since they were little kids you know so it's it's rad to watch all that stuff but i, I can't even imagine like losing your dad and then having that stress of like yeah. thrasher is the this needs to continue i mean like i'm maybe not prepared for it but i'm gonna do my best and then yeah. just kind of killing it is probably like faust is looking down going i knew you had it tony come on you got that <laughs> Fuck yes like dude tony's footage is so sick i'm always he literally skates more than so many people i'm like he's out there making shit happen like between the mag and everything, like his, his crew is so solid, but like Tony yeah. just running shit right. Stan Leandro and all those guys, Luke. Shout out. What was one of the best trips you had, like with with uh, whether it be City or Think? Like, well, what was one of the ones where you bonded with the the guys and you felt the camaraderie of like this is a team? Definitely. I mean. Dude, going up to Detroit during Heartline uh -huh. was just so damn rad. Like, yeah. it was just like the I the crew and just like the edit. Like, we we ended up doing like I think at that point, like I grew up on watching VHSs like Bandis and like Public Domain, and they're like hour long videos. And like watching how Mike Svensson put together Crime in the City, it was like a oh. short edit, and that was like my intro, and it was like. There was like a 19 minute video and it was just like made just like it, it was the crew and it wasn't mm -hmm. too much. And that's how it should be, you know, like in just the name city and we were doing it like we were out there just skating like Tony, bring that shit back. <laughs> yeah, city is a brand you can you can sell to any city, you know, like it's good in Chicago. It's good in fucking down south, whatever, like Atlanta, um, like even getting in uh, like getting involved in that during the time frame it was like i remember the board graphics for like a train map and it was just like a pete Elridge board and i was like dude this vibe like the image was sick like visually yeah. and just the crew like it was just tight niche which was rad what was your first time out of country yeah i remember actually so when i turned 16 it was like on because like we were just like all the friends were staying at my house me manny and that whole crew we were like let's we were hitting every city you know hartford was like the closest but i remember driving up to montreal and that was like a six hour drive and it was like dude we can go to another place like outside of the u.s like that was just insane at that point so we were like 16 and uh i think we had to get like notes from our parents or some shit and ended up going past the border and driving up to montreal and uh we had no idea, never knew anything about it. I think we might have seen like one video that had some clips in it, but for what it is, just like driving around aimlessly and just finding shit. And uh, we had six of us. And I remember we slept in the college outside on the main road. Oh, shit. And I had a saber. So like car, six of us sleeping, like super narrow. We're all tucked in. And the friend, we were like so hot that the friend opened up the door, but it was on the main road. And literally someone just came out and almost clipped the door and it was just like dude like what the fuck is going on like woke up people are just like walking by the car fully <laughs> like steamed out like but it was sick because like the olympic oh we knew that and that was like a staple of montreal so we would go skate like you know it, it was like a rad little warm-up but the montreal stadium had olympic pool that you could pay two bucks for and we had no idea about that you could go swim and jump off the highest diving board. So like we ended up going to skate in the O and then we were like, oh shit, like let's go take showers and like go jump off the highest diving board. 
So that trip was pretty damn rad. Like Montreal, like every year they have this contest called Jackalope. And I try to go back and just kick it with all those guys because it's got such a rad scene. Like Trash Bar has like a bowl in it. Mm. And uh, I mean, there's just so many yeah skaters up there just making it happen. But yeah, Montreal was a rad one growing up, like just off, like, wait, we're going outside the United States, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Is there a funny story or uh, any type of story of how the what the fuck of Bachinski came up? Like <laughs> that whole saying, and then you guys made a video. Like, I have no idea. Tony <laughs> just must have just been like, what the fuck is a Bachinski? <laughs> I, I really don't know. I thought they were going to do like, what the fuck's a Jimmy Cow? <laughs> you know, like run it through. Oh. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Did you ever have any hub ads? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I remember actually my 21st birthday, uh, Tony was like, dude, we'll get you a hub ad. And I was like, wait, what? And uh, there was this chick that was like modeling back in Massachusetts, a friend of a friend's. And I was like, we need a girl. And she ended up coming over to the house. And like, I had all the friends over and we were just playing pool. And we ended up shooting like, yes, yeah, classic hub ad. <laughs> Which was like super rad, but yeah. <laughs> Dude, those things so were we so crazy. I remember like sometimes yeah. they would shoot them at the mag. And one time I went to a local bar with Braden. His was kind of a pool table one too, but like, holy Sick. smokes, what a time. I did the, yeah. um, I don't know if you remember, but I did, a, um, it was like a blind date contest on the Thrasher website to go to the Skater of the Year party. And I had all these dudes and we ended up going, there was somehow I met these two girls online and they were fucking, they went through all the dudes. It was like Chenzo was in there and all, and, and some people from the mag and they picked Chenzo. And so oh, we shit. went and picked them up from the airport. They flew in, we got a limo and went with the hubba girls and stuff. Like it was crazy. <laughs> like wow. we were doing it back then. <laughs> Yeah, it was nuts. Oh, uh, Chenzo is just f straight fuel. Like, Chenzo, he's ripping. like, he's like, who's your favorite skater? And she's like, Mike McGill. She had like a pal <laughs> tattoo on like a tramp stamp. And he's like, oh, fuck that. Chenzo the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> it was so oh, fucking, shit. it was sick. Him, him and Randy, so like, they were hammered. <laughs> like we, I drove him out to the fucking airport. It's so funny. I got on video. Tell me about the meet the stands. Cause that was a fucking sick thing you did out in China. Dude. Love it. Patrick Wallen is just such a rad dude. Like he's behind the lens. Um, he basically is doing a thing called visual traveling and he's going to places that have never been skated and just making short films of those trips and meet the stands. We ended up doing a two week trip and left from Beijing, China and took a train across China and ended up going to Kazakhstan and I ended up leaving from that trip, but they kept it going. I'll explain a little more in a second, but it was wild. Like we ended up taking the train and like we were in Quindo, I believe, like middle of China skating all this stuff that hasn't been skated. And it was like Dan Zarif, um, an amazing skater, Walker Ryan. Um, there was a whole mm. crew and we were just like on the road. Um yeah, just skating things that have never been touched. And when we got to Kazakhstan, there's all these, there's like Turkmenistan. Um, oh man, I'm drawing a blank. Afghanistan and all these different stands. And I ended up leaving and they got denied to go to Turkmenistan. So this is like early 2011, something like that. And Afghanistan was pretty wild at this time between news media and war and everything. Right. And they got denied, but they ended up going to Afghanistan. So the whole trip was like rerouted where they like wow. ended up sending in their visas and all that stuff to the consulate and got denied when they got to the border and had to like pivot and ended up going to Afghanistan. So like I got home from the trip and watching it, I'm like, dude, you guys got into like the raddest, wildest, craziest situation. And yeah, they were just, I mean, you watch the footage, like it's pretty crazy to see some of the spots, but um, yeah, I think 
China, when he said they were starting from there, like I was psyched. Like it, it, for anyone that's a skateboarder, please do yourself a favor, favor, visit Barcelona and go to China because it's like, it's the most magical, raddest place to skate. Like mm. there's no place in the world like China. And I thought the Olympics were going to change it where they were going to knob everything in sight. And there's something about how many spots and what you can get into in these cities like Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing, that there's just skate spots everywhere and it's all marble. And mm. it's the most like our kids aren't going to be able to experience that. So anyone that skates, get over to China and do a trip because you're going to skate some rad shit like mini hubas and like just marble everywhere. And yeah. Have never been touched and just the culture, the people are so nice and it's, it's a whole different world. It's sick. Yeah. Marble everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are you at think until it's demise? Yeah. Like Rob was so rad. Like just, he's from Maine and just yeah. low card in general, like that whole crew, like is so awesome. Uh, that I just, I ended up riding it out like for like three years. It was just like, I was down in LA at this point. I kind of made the transition and, um, I think, I wonder actually when we did business as usual, like Justin ended up filming that video. Mm. I can't remember if that was under Rob when he took it over, but for what it is, like we ended up doing like one short video. For think I like shared a part with Cody McIntyre, and then that's like the last thing I kind of really remember, like the demise mm -hmm. of that. And I didn't have like a board sponsor. I remember, like as a joke, I was like, "Damn, if I go to Tampa, are they gonna let me skate?" Like it was like early days, you know. Yeah, but I, I kind of always just went with the flow. Like I just wanted to skate, so I had boards. Like Rob always helped me out and supported me, which I was super grateful. And I just yeah kept on skating and. um I didn't have a board sponsor for like two years. Like I just kind of went with the flow. I didn't know what to do. You know what I mean? Like I kind of waited. That's always kind of how I've been just like waiting for people to hit me up, but like waiting for those connections to happen, mm -hmm. happen organically, you know, whatever. Um, and during that time I ended up being, I was skating for OC ramps and we were just cruising around and Ryan DeSenzo was like, dude, what do you think about getting on dark star? And I was like, fuck dude, that would be rad. Like that sounds like a, there's a good crew, like Greg Glotzka and like a lot of the friends were involved. And I was like going to that, going down the rabbit hole. And I was like, dude, Chet Thomas, like I used to grow up watching band this, like that's the raddest thing ever to have your, I guess, boss TM, mm. like ha be the owner of this company. So I ended up uh, getting on dark star. I think that was like, I mean, 2015, 14, and uh, that was awesome because of Desenzo. So, yeah, that was kind of the next chapter. Hmm, that's sick. I, yeah, so that's kind of like probably right, I don't know, maybe when you moved to L.A., but like right around then is like when the last time I probably saw you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it. I did a couple quick trips up to San Francisco. Yeah. Just for traveling, I remember like going up and – yeah, just getting visas and stuff like that. There's like the consulate up there for Russia. So I was like always traveling back and forth just to like get like visas and go skate for like a day and stuff like that. But yeah, I got to get back up there. There's like, it, so quick question, China Banks, dude, is it still there? Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. I'm coming up soon. Okay. It's Let me eight. know, dude. I, I did a whole video on China Banks. Did you? Yes. Did, did you see it? Scope it out. No. Yeah, no, it's it's like kind of like all the tricks that have happened and like people like Duffy and Cardiel and Julian talk about their early days and then, you know, T Funk's Ollie at the end and all the, everything up to it. It's such an gnarly place to skate. People look at it and they're like, Oh, that's gnarly. And then they get there and they're like, No, it's gnarly. <laughs> Duffy <laughs> was just in town and I'm like, Let's fucking go to San Francisco, dude. Like, let's go. And he, he was he, so busy they, yeah make, well i'm hitting up him or booze and it's for sure like that watching that like just them skating it like that's the move 
you know. Yeah, De- Dennis skates like nobody too. Like he's doing like hippie jumps under the bench onto the trannies and skating the inside <laughs> of the bench, just like fucking nuts. He's um, one of the best. Tell me about your interaction with Felper because Dan Z told me you gave him a phone call one time asking him a question. And and then I, re- I remembered he also gave you maybe some uh, some talk about the El Toro situation and how that was affecting your career or something. I don't know about that. Fuck. Um, no, I, I, thought he, I thought he always was like, how does it feel to always be the El Toro guy? Like you set your bar high early on in your career or something. Maybe he did say something like that. I don't know. Phelps was always rad. He like living at the warehouse. He'd always crew like come through and just skate. So yep. we'd always like, get a session together. He's a really um, guy. It was just like he was doing his own shit, you know. But like I remember hitting him up, and I was like, "Dude, what the fuck is Animal Chin?" Like growing up on Powell videos, I was like, "What's up with Animal Chin?" He's like, "Dude." what are you calling me for <laughs> uh you know he's like dude it's, it's always being in search you know like get out there and skate and find some shit and uh i remember he yeah dan was next to me i i think it, me and him were talking on the way to a spot and i was like talking about animal chin it's like call phelps like, all right <laughs> but yeah phelps would always like you know, talk shit on mass and all this other stuff. It was always a, a rad time catching up. <laughs> yeah, where was he from? He was from Cambridge? Dude, yeah. So I think he was from South Dove. I think he's like in between where you were talking or when we were talking earlier about the Cape and in between Boston. I think he's like in between that, uh, like a harbor town. Okay. Could be yeah. wrong. Yeah. Yeah, well, me and the wife are going out there, so I want to get like a, I definitely want to get a good bowl of chowder, and I want to fucking like see some shit. We're gonna go see a baseball game at Fenway. It's like one of the oldest stadiums, and like just right. do, do it up. I've, I, I've, I think I've driven through it, but I don't really think I've ever been there and spent like time like checking it out. So I'm excited about that. That's the jam, dude. Yeah, you're going to have a good time. I'll definitely send you over some goodness because, yeah, Massachusetts, especially during the fall season, yeah. is a beautiful place. But, yeah, there's, like, little towns throughout there we're at. I know. I want to go to Little Compton. I want to go visit the package. Like, there's so much shit I want to do, and I'm like, dude, we only have, like, three or four days. Like, we're not going that long. <laughs> I'm like, I got to I gotta prioritize here. Come on, pull it together. Uh, what's your – um? What's your vibe with the social media? I know that you did a poll on Instagram to see what camera you should use for a video part one time, right? <laughs> Probably. I mean, nowadays, like, dude, social is like. I was reading the Thrasher interview and it said something about like, you were making a video and you're like, should I use VX or should I go HD? And you did a poll on the Insta or something. And dude, I mean, everybody dude, was like, VX. Like, I'm all drone. I want like a visual that's just like so random and like you can see everything. I think I kind of went down like the rabbit hole 2018. I ended up buying a drone. And like for me, I was always like, I'm just going to grab a ladder and just put it in the back of my trunk. And like wherever I'm skating, I can get like a top view, you know, like this perspective that's just like unique, like Andrew Reynolds frontside flip, fakie frontside flip down this is skateboarding and from like what it is like having that drone i could just throw it up yeah i can literally just film anywhere and have this visual that's just like showing everything you know the landscape and what's going on i think being in front of a fish eye for so long and then having that opportunity to just like so show show something visually it was awesome you know so over the last like yeah, six years I had just been filming on the side, like just getting out and yeah, kind of in that realm. Like, can social- you film yourself? Like, you just set the drone up and keep it stationary over your thing. And so, to bring it, so actually, I never, I used it because I was going down to Puerto Rico and uh-huh. I was like, Dude, it's tropical. It's like crystal clear waters. We're doing like tours throughout the island every December. And that time frame, I was like, I, I got to get a drone. So I ended up buying one and um, COVID ended up hitting. I was like, shit, like what the heck? So I was back in Massachusetts and um, I was like, I can just throw this drone up for like 20 minutes at a time. (laughs) So during that, during that time where no one was like skating and like, I was 
back home and like around my grandparents, I wasn't like really hanging out with anyone. I mean, I was talking to everyone, but it was like, I really wasn't like out skating that much with other people. So I just like put the drone up and I just like get these clips to just throw on like the story and um, just filming that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, what about the streets? And like, I ended up the transition. Let me bring it back. Like social media. I think we're all at this point where it's like, it's like an ad and it's all like, we get it. Like we don't, I don't care to like do all these social posts for these sponsors and all this other stuff. And like keep up with all this other stuff. Like a lot of it is just garbage on social media and the Mm. skaters that are just posting up random shit. That's the way to do it. Like, it's awesome. Like it's about just like, I think that's a rad way to go about. It's just the personality and like little things like that. So I kind of steered clear from social media for a while and was just like doing my thing, just out skating. And, uh, it transitioned where during COVID, I kind of ended up going down the rabbit hole of like, what is crypto? I'm like, what is all this stuff? Like I was already like investing and stuff. And I was like, the heck is all this stuff about? And basically you probably hear stuff about like NFTs and stuff like that. And I was like, wait, I can put artwork to this token. And I kind of tried to think of something. So like what's playing behind me was had this idea if I can film a bowl because they're all different shapes and like basically have a line loop forever. So I kind of had this idea of like all these different visuals and I would basically film a different skater and it involved the skate industry where I was like out of my helmet and going to all these pools and I'm like, what? like this shit's gnarly. And like watching like Ruby Lily, like she was just ripping this backyard pool and then ended up filming this little line after she ended up filming whatever regular tricks. That's embarrassing to say, honestly. (laughs) But it was like rad to get out of my element and just be part of these sessions and put together something visual. So I ended up learning how to edit over the last like two years to make these lines loop forever. So they're kind of like in this like, yeah, unique shape and just putting together like a whole collection. So the I ended up releasing the first one at zero dollars and it sold for like six grand, seven grand. I was like, holy shit. What? So I ended up letting the world decide its price. And I'm doing a 24 hour auction. And I had done that for the last 53 pool lines. And I'm slowly releasing them. So it's like a five year project or like, I guess it's been two years so far, but another three years, I'm going to try to release like 10 at a time throughout the year. And I just been doing like awesome missions. Like it was rad. Eddie Algara, I ended up linking up with him like a month ago. Sick. Dude, like you invented the fakey Ollie. Like what the fuck? Like just so awesome to get out and just film like people that I would never regularly be out on skating the streets with, you know what I mean? So Mm. Um, I've been making these visual art pieces and kind of releasing them slowly but surely and just, yeah, kind of doing that on the side, staying creative off the board. But yeah, like, yeah, that's kind of the next chapter is we're really early, but social media kind of took over and I didn't want that. And I ended up finding NFTs and stuff like that. And that's where you really build community, almost like social media having a following like the collectors are really important as much as the skaters like i guess the simplest terms like imagine like going to your favorite uh concert you go see david byrne from talking heads Mm. yes like this is the show and let's just say in your digital wallet he would give you a poster a little uh image for attending the show right so this nft in your wallet from david byrne you would connect it to spotify and he's like hey i'm having a new album come out you would get to listen to it two weeks before and then when you connect your wallet to his website you would get discounts from his apparel stuff like that and then when he comes back into town boom you can connect your wallet to ticketmaster and get discounted rates and buy it before the bots and sell it before other people So you'll have like these token structures that you can sell publicly traded 24 hours a day and be like, no, I don't need this little, you know, poster from being part of that. But whoever gets in early 
gets the rewards where they can sell it, you know? So it's like a membership, but that's kind of the realm of like where we're headed and it's just early days. So I'm selling like these art pieces where, yeah. you know, if Steve Cab has like a new shoe come out. I tried pot. Whoever bought his piece, I hope that I can connect them with the early, you know, these these kind of rewards or like, I don't know, just give them a gift. You know what I mean? So, Interesting. That Mike yeah. Moe's really into that stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're nailing it. They're doing it. They're, they're doing it right. Yeah. But it's like the secondary sales. I think that'll like when they're, when a marketplace opens up where they have benefits, like where they open up doors with those benefits and you could sell that piece if you don't need it. I think that'll open up a ton of opportunity for but, the collectors. But with you know? that, you can, you have, I mean, like for cab shoe or something like you have to have a relationship with like vans or cab or something, right? To like yep. get all that stuff going. That must, yep. see, I mean, dude, I'm I'm old and I've I've fucking adapted to almost everything, but mm -hmm. I do not. I can't grasp NFT or Bitcoin. Those two things, like <laughs> they're in my head constantly, and I can't. I I'm like I don't get it. Like I don't understand how. Like let, let's just say they gave you a poster for your wallet and your phone. Why mm -hmm. can't you just can't you just send that to anyone like that and then everyone can have it? Well, so that token is just it's connected to that poster, that image is uh -huh. connected to the token and you have to pay a small little fee that's like one penny to make that transaction to send it from your wallet to another wallet. Uh -huh. And basically when you do that transaction, the thing is the blockchain and the whole thing about Bitcoin is like when you put that transaction through, there's computers throughout the whole world that verify that transaction. So it's not like a one person or a oh, wow. um, an actual like company running that thing. So like Damn. it kind of has that change where it's worldwide participation verifying those transactions. So like I mean in the long term, like I guess you could say NFTs, but like when you go buy a car or buy a house, that deed is going to be on a token mm. and i'm basically just putting artwork on that token okay and that's kind of like yeah the er, the the baseline easiest way to explain it is kind of like the benefits will be like a membership pass okay like for uh, you if like you created a token anyone would get like to listen to it early and get like maybe something from me like a sign board like that's this that's the package oh uh, okay you uh, you let everyone in for early, like for me i ended up uh selling this random art piece for 1500 bucks it was actually uh a decentralized um i don't even, i don't even want to get into it but for what it is a random uh at an ad in thrasher and it was eric winkowski and when you scan the photo you could claim it for 30 days for free and that's how I started to build. And that ended up uh, having over like a hundred collectors and it started getting traded. And it was something that was free that like whoever got in early got to, you know, reap the benefit because it's supply and demand. Damn. But yeah, it, it was really awesome to see that people were supporting me and him. So 25% goes back to his wallet each trade. Interesting. Yeah, I was thinking I, I got to do some research, but I was think. I mean, with the podcast, I think that there's opportunity in that world. I just don't know anything about it. Are you a driverless car? Are you getting into one or no? I'd rather ride a motorcycle. <laughs> exactly. I got a skateboard and a motorcycle. I'm good. <laughs> exactly. Thank Truck you. would be nice. Uh, I know you got to kind of get going. So I got a couple more. Um, when it comes to like, uh, you know, all your video parts and like shooting photos and video stuff. What seems to be one of the toughest battles that comes to mind that you remember? Like, fuck, I, I went there a bunch of times or I took a bunch of hits or it was just one of the things that you like kind of through your struggle, you had the most reward when you made. Oh, man, there are so many like chapters. Like I actually just realized I'm filming for my 20th part right now. Wow. So it's been like the last year I've been just making these missions and it's like, it's been just insane. Like just for this part, um, I ended up flying back to Massachusetts and skating this slide. That's like gotta be like 13 feet and like full bungee. 
So I got the bungee and it ended up breaking. And I was like, fuck, I had to fly back to Ma- or California. So I ended up getting another ticket back to Boston, got a bungee from a friend and ended up making the mission happen and flew back within two days. And like, literally it was like a 13 foot quarter pipe. Like it, it's the raddest spot. And I'm psyched to, yeah, start to put these puzzle pieces together for this. And yeah, kind of, kind of get it out there. But yeah, that's been like the last uh, year just working on that. And um, yeah. <laughs> like, what's, what's the video for? Like, who's it for? Uh, for me. Oh, putting the pieces together. I found out that I was like, wait, this is going to be the 20th part. I have to, like, if, if I film 19 parts, I got to film 20. Like, let's, let's keep these missions going, you know? So Are the you- last year has just been awesome. I've been working with my friend, uh, Tommy, and we've just been making these trips and just, yeah, putting the pieces together. Is it going to be a lot of drone shots? So it's kind of, it's wild right now. I don't have a board sponsor and cause uh dark star ended up you i know, heard that yeah dwindling literally so <laughs> i've been getting they sent me all these boards and they're all blank so i got boards for like years which i'm so grateful but they're all blank and i'm like okay i'm involved in this art space in the nft world all these tricks right so let's say the trick on the slide i have a, a bottom level like a ground level view now i have the drone view so I'm going to have an NFC, different word, NFC chip. So when you tap the board, you'll be able to bring up the visual and it's digitally connected and you can see what trick was done on the board. But then I'm going to have like an artist that has inspired me. Like, hopefully I can get like Evan Hecox or like, you know, neck fix to paint one of these boards and do like a little gallery within the premiere. So that's what I'm like building out right now. So been rad like every spot that i've been going to i'm like what let's like we ended up actually this was another mission we pulled up i'll send you over some of the footage but we built a bridge out to this volcano transition that was like 15 feet tall and like this bridge was two feet high and like full generator in the parking lot building like this bridge and uh yeah oh, it was man. Nuts. it ended up working out I can't I wait to see it because I mean, dude, you're you're. I was thinking about it like, whatever yeah. cheese, cheese and crackers. Okay. Um, like you got that vibe when it comes to mini ramps, and just I feel like your creativity for skate uh, parts. You're always thinking like, you know, salt and pepper, the formula, uh, whatever, roll the dice video. Like you kind of come up with themes and make it cool and and have fun with it. And I think that's like, that's what skateboarding is, you know? Fuck yeah. No, I appreciate it. I'm so hyped like for, for putting the pieces together and like just hitting these dream spots. I'm like, this is my last run of like putting an upgrade. <laughs> 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 we have the workers just showed up to fix okay the you gotta get got going out. um but yeah just getting these last missions in and skating the dream spots and getting out with the homies like that's all i want to be doing so i'm like on that last stretch where i'm like let's try to upgrade in life and try to you know s- see if i can set the bar a little higher <laughs> okay well i know you gotta go um shape three you still doing woodworking yeah so like what i was mentioning like almost all the boards like when you i'm putting in like these chips so when you like tap something from or let's say i make like an axe when you tap it with your phone it'll be the tricks that were done on that board in the axe so like everything from this part i'm kind of like making i'm connecting all the dots where it's like visually you have like a trick done from the part the trick or the board from that trick created into something and um yeah that's kind of like the whole process is like just yeah making it digitally connected from physical to digital and just yeah making a a rad visual from a different perspective Uh, i love what i've seen a bunch on the instagram i love it we'll have (laughs) links to all dave's stuff in the text in the bio below and stuff so you guys can go check that out um definitely check out all the things he's been doing it's very creative and cool uh last question yeah what's the best thing you saw russ milligan do on a skateboard go watch his north port 
best thing out. <laughs> I think it was yeah. North too. That's just Vancouver goodness. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. So good catching up with you and, and reach out anytime. I'd love to see what you're working on. And uh, we need to get you a board sponsor. So fucking <laughs> let's I'm go. I'm up Tony right now. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I'm getting back to the Bay. We're making uh, some shit happen. <laughs> come skate the UM Plaza. Oh yeah, dude, that looks so awesome. Cam so killed that it, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. SF is there's always so much goodness going on, but yeah, that that build was sick. Well, always a pleasure, man. Take care of yourself. Have a good day, dude. Likewise, I'll catch you soon. Peace, y'all. And now a word from our sponsor, Oro Coffee. Mm, that's some damn good coffee. Order one or six bags at orocoffeeroasters.com. Hi, this is Katie Knox of Mysterium. Listen to our song on SMFM at Talking Schmidt, my favorite podcast. You all like music? Because you're listening to SMFM. Welcome, welcome back, good people, to episode four of SMFM. For you, for me, for all of us together in this Daylight Savings Edition where we're going to celebrate the sun, the sunshine, the sunlight with a great band called Mysterium who are from Sweden. And they're just seeing the sun after months of winter darkness. So we're going to listen to Mysterium with the song Close to Me. Sweden's very own Mysterium with the song Close to Me. Shall us talk about daylight, daylight savings? Drives me to drinking some Oro. Mm. Oro coffee. That's some damn good coffee. Anyhow, you can find Mysterium on SoundCloud. www.soundcloud.com slash Mysterium dash chaos. Right there. All right, you don't know what you're going to get on SMFM. So keep tuning in, keep talking Schmidt, and I want to bring the new music to you that you might not hear anywhere else. Until next time, peace. Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. 
It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at TalkingSchmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmidty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. A very special shout-out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout-out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper. Keep the wheels greased.